Dr. Dahmer, always a pleasure to be with you. I Absolutely. love seeing you at Ash, running around and meeting That's people right. <laughs> and talking about new data science as well as your own presentations, your, your, your own data. We're going to tackle a very small topic, acute okay. myeloid very leukemia. Small. Right. But I want to focus on two things to, for our viewers. Take us through AML in the elderly, mm -hmm. the older patients, because a lot of these patients get in the community and, and I think they struggle with what to do for them. Right. And then I want to understand uh, if there's anything that intrigues you in terms of novel therapies. Yeah. Let's start with AML in the elderly. What right. have you seen? Yeah, so I think AML in the elderly in general, there's been a huge improvement with the emergence of venetoclax. So historically, the response rates to standard HMA therapy, azacitine, decidabine, were about 25-30%. Now with the combination azacitine venetoclax, which is approved for older AML, 75 plus, who are considered to be not fit for intensive induction, 70-75% is the CRCR rate. So this is three times higher and the median survival is better. Now that being said, it brings a new set of challenges because the HMA ven, while being highly effective, also causes more myelosuppression. So what we're starting to see is in the community, there is a huge uptake, which it should be because the responses are so good but the learning curve has not caught up in the community as it has in the academics. So we see a lot of people getting venetoclax continuously, two, three cycles, get severely myelosuppressed, come to us then referred with fungal infections, bacterial infections, and sometimes there's nothing we can do in that advanced stage. So I think although venetoclax is highly active, we now have published and many our data are being presented here that you don't need continuous venetoclax. 14 to 21 days seems to be quite sufficient and much less myelosuppressive. Uh, this year's ASH, the French, actually presented a very interesting abstract yesterday showing that seven days of AZA and venetoclax in 80-plus population was giving almost the same response rate, 65% CRCRI, as 21 days of venetoclax in the Viale. So I think we're learning that we don't need too much VEN. You can do less, get similar responses, better quality of life, less transfusions. Now, that being said, there's still about 30% of the patients in the community that we know who are above 80 or still not being offered treatment. I think this is something that really needs to change. I think with the HMA VEN, we need to give them treatment. You may be less venetoclax, but I think they should all be exposed to therapy. So in general, there is improvement. Survival is getting better, but there are new challenges related to myelosuppression and optimizing VEN duration, and that's what we're working on. Yeah. In the AML and the elderly, have you been incorporating the uh, um, cytogenetics and the molecular data or is age by itself kind of, you know, I already know this individual unfortunately is old. I don't really need to, to look at the molecular level because age by itself defines that category. So actually, no, the other way, I think a lot of the fitness for chemo or what we're now starting to call is this patient suitable for chemo is really the terminology I like and many others like. Meaning, let's say you have a TP53 mutation in a 40-year-old patient. Actually, that patient may be physically fit to receive 3 plus 7 or flag IDA, but the response rate and survival is equal or even lower than with HMA VEN. So we actually would give that person HMA VEN. We're doing this for 40, 45-year-olds if they have a high TP53. On the other hand, if they have a core binding factor, inversion 16, 821 AML, if they're 75, I would still probably consider intensive chemo because their survival could be 85%. So we're really using the biological sensitivity of the disease to particular therapies and molecular cytogenetics to decide what therapy we want rather than this arbitrary cutoff of 75 or 70 or 65. Now, that being said, in general, above 70 and even 65 to 70, there's a movement to go away from intensive chemo other than for the core binding factor and NPM on some of the favorable groups. We're using more HMA-based therapy, HMA van backbone. And what we at Anderson are now pioneering, and I think in the next few years, you'll see more and more data from other sites, is to use molecular data to improve on HMA VEN. So if I have a 70-year-old or 72-year-old and they have a FLT3, HMA VEN, yes, the response is good, but the survival is only 11 months. So that's where we're adding the FLT3 inhibitor, uh, girtritinib, to do a HMA VEN girtritinib combo. Or if they have an IDH, we're doing HMA VEN IDH, and we're seeing that that is resulting in much deeper remissions and improved survival. Now, the, the, um, there's a lot that gets told about the advances in transplant, mm -hmm. um, an allogeneic transplant, even at advanced age. In elderly patients, are you still looking at some form of an allogeneic transplant or you feel it's too toxic? 
No, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, I think there's a lot more focus on the AML therapies, obviously, because they're novel and there's excitement and there's support from companies. But Transplant has also improved. And now routinely, actually, our group considers stat tra Transplant in patients up to 78 years of age, 77, 78. Wow. And I was speaking to many other groups, City of Hope, uh, Dana-Farber, and this is actually quite common. Some are even saying 80 years of age. So because of the improvement in GBHD medications, the use of cytotoxic T lymphocytes for BK, CN, the other viruses, JAK inhibitors, abrutinib, actually I think the comfort of transplant to do it in older has gone up. And so we're actually now seeing an increase, significant increase in number of transplants because of two things. One, HMA vendor response rate is three times higher. So if you have 100 patients, you have 70 who will respond instead of 30. So you have a big pool of responding patients who could go to transplant. And second, the transplant is actually like patients who get HMA VEN or HMA VEN plus targeted therapy because they're not as beat up. They don't have mucositis, they don't have severe fatigue, malnutrition, weight loss. So you have a higher response rate and a better transplant candidate. And so we're seeing in our 65 plus, we used to transplant maybe 10, 15%. Now we're doing almost 40, 45% transplant in those patient wow. populations. Amazing. I never yeah. thought I would hear the age of 75 or 80 for transplant. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to novel therapies. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we can never ask for enough novel therapies in a disease that is considered fatal. Right. What What are the top two or three agents that are really intriguing you and you're interested in? Yeah, so I think the top uh, three at this time to me are the menin inhibitors. Uh, you know, these are Niche population, 7 to 10 percent, MLL rear range, but a disease group that has historically done extremely poorly, both in AML. Are those therapy related or could happen without therapy Could related? both. So, you know, about 40, 50 percent of the MLL are therapy related and the others are actually de novo. And, and not just in AML, but this is a common group in ALL, especially in pediatric and infantile ALL. So the menin inhibitors now as single agents are showing close to 50 percent response in the fourth salvage population, median of four uh, prior therapy. So that's amazing because historically we would get less than 10% response in somebody who was a fourth salvage AML and even worse maybe in an MLL rearranged. So the data from Syndax is very, very impressive. But again, the curative outcome will only happen when you move it up front. So if you look at the responses, they're good, but the median is only six, seven months, survival is seven to eight months. I think for a single agent, that's great and we'll hopefully get it to approval. But now how do we move it up front and studies are doing HMA Ven Menin, HMA uh, uh, Intensive Chemo Menin, and I think this will actually probably lead to curative outcomes in MLL rearranged, older and younger populations. And are you able to take some of these patients transplant? They Absolutely. Get... Yeah. So oh, yeah, that's amazing. in that setting, we take them transplant and now we're doing post-transplant maintenance with men. And we actually have our center have uh, at least eight or nine patients who are fourth salvage and beyond sent to us who are alive one and a half, two years So that's later. hopefully will get approval for relapse disease. Initially. With MLL. With MLL or As you guys one. continue to study. And then you move it up front. That's the second great. agent I think that has maybe a broader application is CD47 antibodies. So there's obviously a huge uh, search and interest to develop immunotherapies in all heme malignancies. I think AML has been behind for many reasons. The tumor microenvironment is more complicated. It's much more multi-clonal than let's say ALL or lymphoma. Uh, also, we see that the antigens that we target are often the same antigens on hematopoietic stem cells. But now with the CD47, especially megrolimab, but there are many others, we're starting to see a very good activity, especially in high-risk TP53 AML. So in the frontline setting, there are now two randomized studies looking at azacitine megrolimab versus azacitine venetoclax in TP53 mutated, where we think, based on the data from the previous phase one single arm, that azamagra will probably beat azaven and become the new therapy for TP53 frontline, but also combining Azaven and Magro, so three drug combos similar to the myeloma world for all comers, because Azaven is good, but uh, if you look at the data Keith Pratt's presented yesterday, the three-year survival is only 23%. It's better than 7%, which it was with Aza alone, but we would like to be at 50, 60, 70% in the next decade. So this is the effort to add the Azaven with Magro based on preclinical data from Marina Konopleva on our group versus Azaven placebo randomized study. So we're excited about both these studies, mainly to a new regimen for all comers and especially for TP53, we think this agent is an important step pathway forward. Um, and then the last one I think is CD123, you know, uh, there's CD123 antibodies, there's a drug called Tivecomab that uh, we have been quite involved and excited about, especially in disease called BPDCN, which is related to AML, but also in AML, we have CD33 antibody gemtuzumab for many years, 
but we think CD123 is the second equally or more attractive target. And this agent IMG N632 or Pivecumab is showing very good activity and importantly a much better safety profile than other CD123s that are approved like Tegraxofusp, etc. So we think this will also have a role definitely in BPDCN and likely also in AML, maybe in combinations with HMA VEN uh, or in the salvage setting. My last question for you, have you been using MRD in clinical practice outside of studies in making some decisions? We use it uh, in clinical practice mainly for transplant decision. So, you know, if we have somebody who got intensive chemo, they achieve remission but they're MRD positive, often we will lean towards transplant even if they're intermediate or favorable. We also actually have a very large study called the Intercept study that Andrew Way, Courtney DiNardo, me, Marina Konopleva have been working on the last few years, which is <laughs> going to be the first prospective MRD-directed study. So <coughs> we're going to look at eight arms. It's a large effort. Uh, FLIT3, IDH1, IDH2, MLL, TP53, others. And we're going to do a, a targeted intervention of doublets. So if you have a FLIT3, giltritinib, plus venetoclax. If you have IDH, yeah, yeah. IDH yeah, yeah. and so and we have a big MRD committee. We're going to do single cell sequencing plus flow based MRD and hopefully show that you can achieve MRD conversions with an improved biological impact. So these studies are coming. The Germans are doing similar studies. British are looking at it. I think that's the future in the next five to 10 years. I think MRD will become the key endpoint rather than CRs or marrow CRs and things like that. Dr. Dabur, thank yeah. you so much. Happy holidays. Always a pleasure to catch up with Same you. Same here. Thank, thank you, Tammy. Yeah.